Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. A- 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 Matthew Dickerson. Tech, 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 tech talk. Tech, 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 tech talk. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Hello, all and sundry, and welcome back to your safe place here at Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. We've got nine more reasons for you to hang around today, so not the least of which is going to include the latest in smart locks for security conscious and smart glasses may well be making a second run after a bit of a false start, of course. And we'll learn why you should never make a chess robot cranky. But before we go any further, please welcome with a rousing round of applause our tech mastermind, Matthew Dickerson. What have you been up to this week, Matt? They sound like a crowd of millions there, James. Yeah, yeah. It was good. Good impersonation. Uh, this week, I've actually been up at your school and looking at a really interesting concept, Charge Around Australia. It's worthwhile going and look at their website of a guy who's got a Tesla and wants to drive around Australia. Well, it's an awesome, awesome concept. He, yeah. He's just, um, uh, I dare say, sorry, hesitate to say an eccentric, but um, <laughs> he's uh, already circumnavigated Iceland and the UK and he was looking for a bit more of a challenge, so he's come to Australia to now, circumnavigate Australia. In and of its own, doing a circumnavigation of Australia on an electric vehicle is not that big a deal. It's been done many times. If you ever care to go to the Tesla Owners Club of Australia, they've got little certificates they give out to people that can say, yes, I can show that I circumnavigated Australia in an electric vehicle, normally a Tesla, obviously, and away I go and I get this certificate. So happy days. But as you know, what was really fascinating about this concept is you've got some guys from the Newcastle, University of Newcastle, and they're taking along about 18 strips of plastic with them that have got PV cells in a different way that we would normally expect to see PV cells to actually roll them out and get some charge into the car. Yeah, it's a a brand new sort of technology that they're they're trying to, um, well, improve uh, with the photovoltaics there. And, um, yeah, they've got these really, really thin uh, photovoltaic cells that, uh, yeah, nanometers thick, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So thinner than a human hair. But it looked fascinating and just rolled out. They were just parked there and rolled out these rolls. I'm guessing here they'd probably be, what, 12 meters long, somewhere around that? Uh, well, they needed about 40 meters squared for that. So I'm think, thinking it was probably a little bit more. I think it was, might have been 20 meters long. But anyway, yeah, right. Yeah. So 20 meters long. They had 18 of them they could roll out across there. And what was fascinating was... They talked about the efficiency, and they're actually quite low in the efficiency at the moment. We've often talked about PV cells on someone's rooftop, and they might be getting up around 18, 20, 24% even. Mm. These were in single percentage figures, 1% or 2%. They're aiming to get maybe up to 3 to 5%. Yeah, which sounds like, oh, well, what's the value in that? That's right, and that's exactly what I said to one of the PhD students there. No, I don't think they're students anymore. I think they're actually... No, no, no yeah. yeah. yeah yes. One of the, the researchers there, PhD researchers there, I said, well, that doesn't sound that good because on my rooftop I've got better efficiencies than that. He said, exactly right, and that's what we've been focused on. We're focused on efficiencies, but they're focused on how much per kilowatt hour. And I went, yeah, wow, that's quite yeah. interesting. Let's focus on something different. So rather than get these really efficient solar panels that cost a certain amount of money, if they can make them incredibly cheap, which these are, mm. and they've got this incredibly thin plastic, the applications for them are dramatically different. And he said they had examples where some people wanted to put PV cells on their factory. So they've got this huge surface area there and they want to put PV cells across all that. But by the time you put all these PV cells that are made typically of glass or glass front on them, It gets fairly heavy. Mm. So then they've got to spend a whole bunch of money to strengthen the roof of their factory to make sure they can put the PV cells on top. Then when you do the maths around all that, you say, oh, I don't know if it's such a good idea. Take these that are, as you said, very thin. They've got plastic. Roll them out across the rooftop. Well, sure, it's not going to be quite as much electricity you generate, but in terms of how much it costs you to generate that electricity, much cheaper. Yeah. So that seemed interesting. The plastic as well wears out. A PV cell, we know people often guarantee them for 25 years. They'll last much longer than that. The plastic that these are made out of might only last a few years. And then you recycle that plastic. And again, you think, well, that doesn't sound that good. But it's all about how cheap it is to produce it. They That's said right. that they could produce that much better in terms of much longer lasting plastic, but then that increases the price. So they're really just aiming on one piece of or one criteria, which is how cheap can we make electricity? Yeah, bingo. And um, these things can be made really, really fast. They print them out, mm. um, which is just amazing. And as we said, nanometers thick. So the, the amount of resources that they're using uh, are minimal, and it's you know a lot of it is recyclable. They've actually got PhD scientists working on recycling everything. But, um, yeah, 
we could be seeing a major, major revolution in how solar voltaics are taken care of. Yeah, so this project will go over the next few months. They'll drive around Australia. As you said, you've got Stuart who comes from the UK initially, so he's done a few other projects elsewhere driving along. They've got the scientists from University of Newcastle doing the background work, talking to students at school, which I love that idea. And they actually said to me at one stage, they said, so how do you see us doing the education piece better? How can we get into the kids' heads what we're doing here? I said, you don't have to worry about it. The kids have got it. The kids have got it mm. nailed. Mm. What you've got to do is educate the 40-year-olds, the 60-year-olds, yeah, the people in leadership positions, because every kid I talk to, they know where the future is going. They know what sort of electric car they'll own. They want to know all about the specs of different electric cars that I might be driving. So they've got it. They understand it completely. What you've really got to do is get those yeah. people that are in leadership positions. Now, in 20 years' time, when these kids that have had some great education from some great teachers – when they're all over it, they're making the right decisions, but we need to make the right decisions now. Mm. Anyway, take that charge around Australia, have a look at it. Looks like a fascinating concept. Good luck to the guys. I'm glad I could have a look at it and actually just understand a bit of what they're about. And they'll be doing their actual proper runaround between um, September and uh, December, I understand. Oh, so this isn't it now. I thought they'd start it no, now. No, no, no. So this is the dry run. This is just the test run to see, make sure that everything um, runs well. And, okay. And of course, as they're doing their run, they'll be stopping in at schools and whatnot and, yeah. and just talking to people about their their new cells. And, of course, folks, yeah, please understand that these cells aren't sitting on top of the car while they're driving. <laughs> they unroll these and charge these up um, on yeah, in a park or on a field somewhere, um, and then they you know, go off for their drive. So, yeah. Yeah, and it's a look like a really fun project, actually. Absolutely. Now, have you ever lost a bag at the airport? Is there anything more frustrating than standing there at the baggage return and slowly... The, the milling group gets thinner and thinner and thinner and there are fewer and fewer bags doing the rounds and, and you're telling yourself that somebody has to get their last bag um, dropped off on the conveyor belt, but um, it could be yours and it never comes. Well, there's the that's where the Apple AirTag comes into the fore and it has done again and again and again for so many travellers here in Oz, Matt. Uh, this is uh, the ultimate safeguard against losing bags, I guess. Well, it is a bit sad that we've had to come up with our own solutions. And I had that exact experience you're talking about there. I went to Canberra so a few weeks I. ago. Yep. And it's just a simple trip. Like Canberra's not that far away. It wasn't even an international flight. And I sat there at the carousel and the bag. But did you have the air it. tag? I didn't have an air tag Neither in there. Neither did I. No, but I just sat there watching, watching and going, that's the last bag. And Someone's got to be the last time, so it could be me. <laughs> that's right. But, but once you said the, the third time, you go, mm, it's not going to be me. And anyway, they found my bag that night and I still got it that night. So that was okay. I didn't have to wear the same pair of undies for too long, which is, which is always good. <laughs> but I do use Bluetooth trackers and Bluetooth trackers came out in about 2013. I use them for car keys. My daughter's got one in a teddy bear. There's a whole range of uses that we have for those Bluetooth trackers. But what's been incredible out of this experience and just to give you some data about it's not just people feeling like they're losing more bags, the rate at the moment for international passengers is 8.7 suitcases lost per thousand passengers. So it that's seems high like enough. It does seem high, doesn't it? That's an increase of 24% over last year. So yeah, that seems okay. like a fair jump. And even if you looked at, okay, last year maybe there wasn't as much travel because obviously we're still in a pandemic. If you go back to the last full year before the pandemic, it's an increase already this year of 30% over the last year where mm -hmm. air travel was what we would call somewhat normal. In the US, they've seen a 67% increase. And Qantas actually said recently they're losing one in 10 bags in Sydney. What? So that's just an incredible number. So people have said, let's complain to the airline. Sure, that didn't get them very far. So now people are saying, let's go and look at Bluetooth trackers. Now they've been searching, and this is where I got some of this data from. You can go and see the popular search um, phrases that people put into Google. So I went and looked at that, and up near the top with a bullet is the term Bluetooth tracker, also the term luggage tracker, and also the term AirTag, Apple's AirTag. Yeah, so yeah. people are saying, I'm buying those now to put them in my luggage to basically track my luggage. So forget about the airline tracking my luggage, I'm taking it into my own hands. And there's been some great <laughs> little stories so far where people have waited and waited, and then they've finally gone to the airline and they say, look, see this map here? I know it's at this airport, and I can't get to that spot in the map, but if you can take me there, I can tell you where it is. And so they've actually been taking some people to where the Bluetooth tracker says yeah, right. their bag is. You can have all these and there's a pile members of the of bags. general public That's right. <laughs> wandering around the tarmac. and <laughs> pile of bags sitting there, and then they can make a sound, of course. So you press a button on your phone, and it makes a sound. Yeah, right. And then, right, just 
get down to the bottom of that whole big pile there, and there's my bag. Thanks very much. So this is what we're going to see more and more. So and of we- course it's a headache for the baggage handlers and whatnot because no one wants to lose your bag, obviously. But when they got a big pile of lost bags, it's yeah. like, let's get this thinned out as soon as possible, folks. Well, there was one flight recently There was just a flight for bags because oh. one airline had that many bags built up that they knew had to get to a certain airport and they just had been lost along the way. So oh, but that wow. will pile up a whole plane full of them. So if you look at Bluetooth trackers, Bluetooth trackers are fantastic. I've given them to my kids as Christmas presents. I'm a big fan of them. The brand Tile is the one I've been using, but there's different brands available. So the only problem that people have then with Bluetooth trackers is that Bluetooth has a range of maybe 10 metres at best. You're not normally within 10 metres of your bag at an airport. Mm. So they then rely on having another phone running the same app somewhere nearby that Bluetooth tracker. So if I take Tile, for example, the brand that I use, if someone else is near my bag, wherever it might be in the world, and they've got the same app, without them even knowing about it, they're actually acting as a relay to pick up the signal from my Bluetooth tracker and send it to my phone via this wonderful internet thing we have kicking around the whole world. So that all works fantastically. But the problem is I'm relying on someone else having the Tile app yeah. somewhere near my Bluetooth tracker. Tile's pretty good. They've got pretty good market share across the world. But when Apple, and they've only done it about a year or so ago, when they finally came out with their AirTags, the huge advantage they have is that they use the Find My feature on iPhones and iPads. So everyone that's got an iPhone out there, everyone that's got an iPad out there automatically Uh has the software installed that you need. So all that means then is your tracker, your AirTag, not your tile, (laughs) your AirTag just has to be near someone else with an Apple device, an iDevice, and that'll track your phone. So that's where AirTags have been now catching up very quickly to tile and being more popular. But you can imagine around an airport, there's going to be someone within 10 metres of that bag that's got an iPhone sticking in their pocket. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's made it much but easier. But what about out the back? I'm thinking about it with storage and stuff like that. The lost and found, you know, they've got to have these big rooms with all these bags in them. As long Surely as you'd have to have, like, maybe maybe it'd be pertinent for the airport to have a number of phones in there with different <laughs> apps sort of that strategically placed around inside that room. You're assuming the airlines really want people using these sort of trackers. Maybe the airlines <laughs> are a bit embarrassed about it. So, uh, But there's still staff out there. They've got to get rid of their pile of bags. Well, that's true, too. It's costing them money to store them somewhere. But there's presumably staff out there who are working in that area. As long as they've got either the Tile app or whatever brand you're using in there, on their phone in their pocket or an iPhone in their pocket, then it's going to be close enough for those bags for you to see it. But I, I can't see this changing in the immediate future. I think you'll see more and more people going and putting these different devices, whatever Bluetooth tracker you choose, in your bag. So when it gets to the other end and they say, sorry, so we've lost your bag, well, let me help you find it. Yeah. <laughs> Something a bit different from the individuals. Very good, very good. Have you got a smart lock, folks? Well, smart locks are getting even cleverer and ditching the battery altogether, harvesting their energy from your phone. Matt, how smart is that? I assume the smart lock's default is deadlocked until your phone comes close enough and then it wakes up. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. And I've used a few of these smart locks over the years, and I love the idea of just trying out technology. And we had one that didn't work so well that we had a lock on our shop at the front of it, and it didn't actually get to the stage where it unlocked, and for whatever reason it failed. So our staff had to go and buy some bolt cutters to actually get into the <laughs> shop one morning. So, so they're down, down, down the hardware me, store. Gentlemen, we'll be with you shortly. That's right. <laughs> it did look somewhat dodgy. People in uniform sitting there with bolt cutters cutting away, and they actually they bought one set of bolt cutters, and they came back, and they were only about three quarters of metres long. They couldn't get through it, so they had to go back to the hardware store and buy this set buy of bulk cutters ones. that were two metres long to get enough leverage. To... <laughs> anyway, so I'm not saying they're no good, but in this particular case, well, and that wasn't the case in that particular example, you can get a battery that goes flat. Now, they've got a USB port or some sort of USB-C port typically that you'll plug in and charge up the battery in there. So if it does go flat, you can plug in, wait around for a few minutes till it's got enough charge in it, then you can connect to it and unlock it. So that'll make sense. But... NFC is, and that's something that we use typically with our PayWave, for example, and our credit cards. NFC relies on the power of the device sending out the signal. So, for example, on your credit card, you've got a chip inside that. When you bring that near an FPOS machine, the tap and go, then NFC stands for near field communications. It's got to be very near. Mm-hmm. It gets enough power from the FPOS machine to energize your credit card to say, really? Hi, yeah, yeah. I'm Matthew Dickerson's credit card and then all my details, and the FPOS machine receives that, 
and away you go. Because people, I know when NFC first came out, people went, well, how often do I have to replace the battery on my credit card? No, you don't need to because it's harvesting power from mm. the FPOS machine. So then manufacturers have said, hmm, if it's got enough power in there to power your credit card, is there enough power there to power a padlock? And it turns out the answer is yes. yes. <laughs> as long as you don't mind waiting for a few seconds for it to get enough power. So it's got a capacitor inside there. It harvests some power, builds up enough charge in that capacitor to then allow it to actually release the lock. And as you can imagine, it's not having to do a lot of work in a padlock. It just needs to be able to move some very small little components of that to allow that lock to actually then be released. Yeah, Yeah, to have a spring load on there and then release it all. But it sounds brilliant. And then I started thinking about, well, what else could you actually power? What other things are low power things that you want to be able to use with some security and then start unlocking with your phone? So you just take your phone, move it up very close, and that's what unlocks it. And a whole range of things I can think of that pop out, but a lot of them do involve locks. A lot of them involve locks on your front door, for example. But imagine if you could power things like your kitchen scales. So you've got a set of kitchen scales and you want to read that because you're doing some menu or something on your phone and yeah. you just say, oh, what's the weight of that? Forget about having to replace the batteries. If you don't want to use it, I've got to put new batteries in. Hold up your phone against that. Kitchen scales don't use much power. Yeah. So that was you know one little simple example of I, I could think of. But again, what about books? You know, when you get those little books or even birthday cards, they've got a little battery inside them mm. that play, you open it up and it sings happy birthday uh-huh. or, or kids' yeah, books okay. that sing along. Anything like that that doesn't take much power but they're all using those little button batteries at the moment. So yeah. I thought, wow, imagine having a card that you get and you say to someone, here's your birthday card, put it near your phone. Oh, why would I do that? You put it near your phone, next thing you know, the card starts playing a tune. I just yeah. All sorts of things. But the lock will be the first thing I think that will go off because you want the phone, the security from the phone, and the power from the phone to make it all work. Very clever indeed. The big EV push is definitely a thing, and there's been a bit of talk at work lately. It's some real armchair experts, shall we say, sceptics. It may surprise you to know who have decided that the whole thing is still a bit of a pipe dream. Well, General Motors is opening the floodgates with an EV live question and answer platform that may just turn scepticism into curiosity and curiosity into sales, Matt. I thought they were just doing it to educate people. You're saying they want to sell cars out of this. Is that what it's all about? Oh, no. My whole idea has been shattered now. (laughs) It is interesting, though, if you're a salesperson for a car company now that was trying to sell an EV, in the past, as a salesperson, you would have had to know the specs of your car and the competitors and Mm -hmm. all the various features and what it could do for you and how it could make your life better and the pricing. Now, a salesperson for an electric vehicle needs to be able to understand all the electric vehicle questions, the range or the yeah. range anxiety people might have, how the charging works, all these questions that you wouldn't think normally you have to know as a salesperson because people understand it. So a lot of the sales work that I think you do as a salesperson is about education. Mm. Someone comes in to buy an electric vehicle, you've really need to, go to educate them to get them to a certain level of understanding And then once they're at that level of understanding, you can then sell them your vehicle as a preferred vehicle. But are people going to be going in to buy an electric electric vehicle without having done a little bit of research themselves these days? It's kind of the people who are going in to buy another sort of vehicle that you want to educate and see the merits in buying an electric vehicle. Well, that's true too. And where GM have said that they've got to do a better job is actually just do that education piece. Let people make up their own mind after they've been educated. Because when you go in to buy a certain GM vehicle – then you probably don't want someone trying to talk you out of that into yeah. an electric vehicle because you might just go, oh, forget this, I'll go next door and buy a different brand. So they've got EV Live now. And so you can go on EV Live, chat in real time on your computer, on your smartphone, and they've actually manned it. This is going to sound a bit revolutionary and a bit of a breakthrough. They've manned it with real people, not bots. <laughs> so you've got real people on the end of the line. You jump on and you start typing away, well, I want to buy an Isn't EV. What we used to do in the olden days. Oh, stop it, James. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> so you get there, you type your question in, I want to buy an EV, but I don't want to have to charge up for 10 hours every five minutes. What a ridiculous concept. Can you tell me more? So there'll be someone who will answer their questions and tell them about charging and how charging works. And I'm really worried about, I don't know, the maintenance on there. When I drive it, where are the maintenance places? Well, you don't really need to do much maintenance on an EV. So all these different things, all these different issues people have. So they've got some experts that aren't trying to sell you a car, apparently. They're trying to just educate you 
about EVs in general. Once you've been educated enough, sure, now go and visit one of our showrooms. I'm sure there's a sales pitch in there somewhere. Go and visit one of our showrooms. Go and talk to people about EVs. They will stop. They did say they'll talk to people about other brands just to give them a broader picture of electric vehicles in general. But they have said they stop when people start talking about Tesla power walls. I want to put a battery in my home. I want to put a Tesla power <laughs> wall in. Sorry, you really need to talk to Tesla about that. Yeah, right. This is GM that we're talking to here. So they have been giving out basic information about cars, but they do stop when they start talking about something as specific as a Tesla power wall. But it is a different world. I think yeah. that education is so important. You can't sell something that people don't understand. Mm. And I think that's the real challenge for car manufacturers at the moment. They've got to get people to understand. Once they do that, I think their sales will go through the roof. Well, people also would argue about, you know, I think I might have even mentioned it in the past, Thomas Edison needed to educate people about how important it was to have light bulbs, in particular his light bulbs, in yeah. their house when they already had a, a convenient way of lighting their house with kerosene lamps. Yeah, um, why would I need that fang dangled electricity? I've got kerosene you've lamps. You've got to put all those wires in your walls yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah why how, would how you clumsy. want to do that? Um, and so, yeah, part of his job was just, um, you know, in educating people about changing the way they think. Mm. And I think the other part of this really is that the sales people who get it best, who understand it best, they will sell these vehicles. Mm. But some of the sales people are still understanding petrol cars, ICE cars, and they just happen to keep going along that path and poo-poo the, the electric vehicle concept. But I think those sales people that really understand it and get it and start talking to people about it, they'll be the ones who will be winning the sales target games within their company yeah. very shortly. For those of you out there who are currently studying the HSC chemistry syllabus, well, that's possibly not a lot of people, but maybe there are lots of our listeners who are, you'd be well aware of the organic chemistry and chemical structure of hydrocarbons and fuels. You'd also be aware of the products of combustion being carbon dioxide and water. And for the past 150,000 years or so, it's been pretty much a one-way reaction. Yeah, we've been using apparently coal, I was looking this up, coal in caves and stuff like that. So ancient cavemen were using burning coal believe it or not. Um, But some clever scientists have learned how to reverse the reaction and remake the long chain hydrocarbons back into jet fuel from those very products, the carbon dioxide and water. Matt, are we possibly looking at carbon neutral jet flight here? It is a great concept, isn't it? And we've talked about electric propulsion for planes and it seems to be maybe that one, one and a half hour, one and a half hour plane flight is about the sweet spot for electric propulsion. Mm. When you start flying Sydney to LA, New York to London, some of those longer flights, you start to load up your plane with so much battery that it defeats the purpose of having the plane get up in the air anyway because you've just got too much weight in the battery. So then you start to talk about hydrogen maybe as a new fuel, a lot of retrofitting you have to do to those planes, pull out those good old-fashioned engines, put in hydrogen, storing the hydrogen, all sorts of issues. And we know we've talked about it before, Airbus is doing some experimentation and that. That's something that some companies are working on. But why not just burn carbon-neutral kerosene? Mm. That sounds better, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> sure, but now you're drinking. So, so we've got these planes that are already geared up to, to with certain engines to, to deal with the kerosene-based fuel. Yeah. Why not keep doing that? But how do you do that in a carbon neutral way? Well, exactly as you said, there's companies out there now that are actually turning or creating jet fuel from water and carbon dioxide. So you turn it into kerosene and then, of course, when it combusts, it comes out as water and carbon dioxide. So you take some water and carbon dioxide, convert it and converts back. So if you take that carbon dioxide from the air, you have got a carbon neutral way of flying a plane without having to modify dramatically all the componentry, all the engine, everything you've got there at the moment. Now, there's one company who's just taken it out of the laboratory and they've taken it out into the field with a solar radiator to generate the power to actually do the conversion. So now we're taking renewable power. Don't know where they're getting the carbon dioxide from. I think they're probably not getting (laughs) it from the air, but let's assume at some stage they'll get it from the air. So you've got renewable energy, you've got water and carbon dioxide from the air, Convert it into kerosene and then convert it back the other way when you burn it in a plane. Doesn't that sound brilliant? That sounds like a brilliant idea. It does, doesn't yeah. it? So a great way to do it. Now, again, you think that probably initially it's going to be more expensive, but it's pretty expensive drilling for oil and then going through a process to convert that oil into some form of fuel. But if you can take it from a renewable power plant, the cost of the plant is the initial cost, but after that, the ongoing cost of running that is going to be fairly low, you would think. 
So I hope so, yeah. Yeah, so it sounds absolutely fantastic. So this fuel can be blended with conventional jet fuel if you wanted to start off with that, or it can get to the stage where you can run it completely on this fuel, and again, what comes out the other end is just recreating what you had in the first place. So this is all happening over in Spain at the moment. It's uh, This factory's been built in Spain, as I say, the first one out of the laboratory, and we're thinking that maybe in so far it's been running for nine days, been producing the fuel at this stage. But if they can keep it going, it's just a matter of ramping up the volume. And this is a pretty important part because jets, our transport system with planes, creates about 5% of our human-caused greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a fair chunk if you can yeah, convert enormous. that. And it's one of the ones that people have been challenged. We talk about electric cars, we think in general, that we've got a fairly good solution going forward to get people out of burning petrol in cars to using electricity and getting or removing the greenhouse gas emissions from all of that process. But planes have always been that one that's been a bit more of a problem, especially mm. those long-haul flights. But if you can do it this way, just love it. So, yep, for all those chemistry students out there that think, oh, I've seen this chemistry for HSC, but I'll never use it in the real world. Well, hello, they're using yeah. it in the real world. It's um yeah just amazing amazing uh, and as I say for so long we've just taken for granted that these are now waste products carbon dioxide and water um, they're now the fuel. Yeah. Here's one that you may have seen on the news, folks. Did you see the chess robot in a Russian tournament crunch that poor seven year old boy's finger? Yep. Ouch. Matt, Isaac Asimov said that that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> well, Isaac was talking about computers that were, or sorry, robots that were designed to be in that environment. What they did here was they took an industrial robot. An industrial robot, think about it, is in that a factory. dangerous already. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> it's in a factory where there aren't people around, and it might have a job of putting some welds on that car, on that vehicle as it comes through the production line. You don't have someone sitting in there getting in the road of it. You don't have someone having to mm. let it think about things. It just goes, put the weld, they're there and there, that's your job, let it move down the next part of the production line. So they took an industrial robot to begin with, and they reprogrammed it to play chess. And then they thought, we'll put some rules in place for the humans, and you've got to have your turn, then you've got to move back and let it have its turn. And we won't worry about putting a camera on the robot to let it see what's happening there. And then we'll let a seven-year-old kid play. What could possibly go <laughs> wrong? <laughs> now, you say to an adult, don't put your finger in there. Something could go wrong. Have your turn on the chessboard and then stand back. Most adults, most sensible adults would say, sure. But seven-year-olds don't always follow the script. Sometimes there's impulsiveness. That's right. And so this particular industrial robot was playing four games of chess at the same time in a shopping centre just to show off cool robotics until the seven-year-old came along, had his turn, and then I think he changed his mind and then decided to put his finger back in when it wasn't his turn. And, of course, the robot did what any robot would do. There's something on the board that shouldn't be on there. I'll just move it out of the road. And so he grabbed hold of the kid's finger. Now, the kid kind of resisted a bit. And the robot, being just a touch stronger than the seven-year-old, just kept pushing it out of the way, making sure it was had a good hold of it and just moving it out of the road. <laughs> and so the fight continued on. A few people piled in, tried to take the robot away from the kid. And finally, they got it released, but the kid had a finger that wasn't quite as good as it was before the process yeah, started. The organiser said, yes, this is bad. That was a direct quote from the organisers, just in case you weren't sure if this was bad or not. The organiser said, yes, this is bad. And it's okay kids got off to hospital and he came back the next day with a, a cast on his hand and kept playing the tournament with his other hand but he'd learned a valuable lesson <laughs> also had an awesome story to tell his friends at school that's right and in 10 years time he'll tell that story and they won't believe him they'll say sure thing <laughs> as if a robot would do that to you robots are so advanced now they're just so sweet and lovely to get along with that must have been a rogue robot but anyway next time you're playing with an industrial robot just let it have its turn I think <laughs> and back off Our next story is about glass holes, Matt. I'm just going to let you explain this one. I thought this was a family-friendly show, James. That sounded <laughs> almost like a swear word, didn't it? Way back when, way back 10 years ago. We're talking Google Glasses, aren't we? We are yeah. talking Google Glasses. Way back then, Google brought out their glasses, and they could do a few things. They could actually be used as cameras. They could actually give you some information on the inside of your glasses, and a few came out, and a few people bought them, and anyone that saw someone in a pair of Google Glasses thought that they were probably a bit of a tosser and they probably acted a bit like that. So they very quickly got the name of glass holes because it rhymes very nicely with another word that I won't say on this particular show. And so from a PR perspective, not from a technology perspective, Google finally withdrew their glasses. Move forward 10 years, 
everyone's taking photos everywhere now. You can't go mm. very far before you'll go past someone that's got a phone out, a camera out, Too taking many pictures. Influ- influencers out there, that's oh, the problem. They are, they are. I was actually out on our cycle way the other day, just out for a bike ride, and I saw someone standing on the side there, filming themselves, chatting away, just standing off to the side. I mean, I don't really want to be in the background in their video, so I kind of took a, a longer way around. But again, <laughs> were they influencer? Were they just talking to one of their friends? Who knows? But it's something we've become accustomed to now, mm. that people are just out there with a phone, taking photos, taking videos. So having someone with that technology in their glasses is probably not that big a deal anymore. So again, we've moved forward 10 years. Maybe it's more acceptable now. So maybe the Google Glass concept is more acceptable and the technology has moved on. So the actual camera in the Google Glasses would be so much better than it would, would have been 10 years ago. The batteries are better. So the battery life is much better than it would have been 10 years ago. So there are many manufacturers out there now that have got the equivalent of Google Glasses ready to go. But they don't want to reintroduce them. They don't want to be <laughs> the one that goes first. Exactly right. They don't want to be <laughs> the next Google Glass, even though it's probably more acceptable now, even though the technology's improved dramatically, but they just know so the hard time. This is a marketing time. problem. This is a less marketing than a problem. Technology <laughs> That's problem. exactly it. You've hit the nail on the head. But we're at the point now where Google is about to say, what the heck? We did it last time. We're going to be first to market. And I think once they become first to market second time around, there'll be other companies out there who will launch their products as well. So don't be surprised if before or too long, you're walking along, you go, gee, I didn't know that person needed glasses. I just chatted him last week and he didn't seem to wear glasses. And then you might just see him tap him on the side or you might see a little LED light on the front of the glasses. You hear someone go, oh, glass hole. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You might but that could become well. a badge of pride. Well, I'm a glass hole. It might be this time around. It wasn't last time around, but maybe maybe a bit like when mobile phones first came out and people said, oh, I see that yuppie with a mobile phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's like, oh, I'm a yuppie with a mobile phone. So maybe you're right. Maybe it will be something. We can experiment with that, James. We can start wearing them around and we'll see what see people what do. Happens. See what the reaction we get is. See how many times we get pushed in puddles and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought that one brief second would cause such a problem. But Matt, the concept of a leap second in the computer world is upsetting the Apple cart somewhat. It is upsetting the Apple cart and the Google cart and the Amazon cart and yeah, the Microsoft all cart. The carts That's right, on all the fabulous carts. interweb. For people that may not be totally familiar with it, we have leap seconds. Mm. Since 1972, we've had 27 leap seconds. And this is basically just, I mean, we conveniently come up with 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes an hour. 24 hours in a day, all these things. And then we have leap years to correct for that. So we know that there's not really 24 hours in a day. There's 23 hours and 56 minutes-ish. Mm. And so, but we have leap years every four years, except every 100 years. So you've got all these different rules around leap years. So that all works. That was actually a good little quiz when the year 2000 rolled around because the year 2000, everyone that understood leap years, every four years, yes, leap year, but the year 2000 wasn't leap year. Oh, no, but it was because every 100 years you miss, but every 1,000 years you don't miss. So it was actually, a, <laughs> a, for, so for people that knew a little bit, they knew, hey, every 100 years you don't, but if you knew a bit more, it was a 1,000-year problem. So there's all those complications around leap years. But even with all those adjustments to keep what we understand to be the Earth's rotation in sync with our simplistic clock system, every now and again, we still have to have the little leap second thrown in there. As you can imagine, a leap year throws things out. I know someone who was married on the 29th of February. Conveniently, he says, I don't have to worry about an anniversary every four years. Well, I've got a sister that we insisted was only allowed to have a birthday every four years. She was born on the 29th. Yeah, yeah, Wow. Yeah. I think that that would be, it'd be interesting to talk to her to see whether she's ever had problems filling in paperwork where it says date of birth and she's put 29th of February and the system doesn't recognise it because I'm sure there'd be some yeah, computer systems that wouldn't actually recognise it so she doesn't exist in that particular system. <laughs> or maybe, as you say, it might be she's only four years old, but she's really 16 years old, for example. Well, she now, she wears it as a badge of pride now because she's so much younger than the rest of us. Yeah, of course, of course, that's right. She just can't get a license yet. So, (laughs) but the problem is that when we have these leap seconds, when they occur, instead of going from 23 hours, as in 2300 hours, 59 minutes, 59 seconds to zero, it goes to 60 seconds. So you you actually see a 59 turning into a 60 rather than a 59 turning back to zero, zero, goes to 60, then goes back to zero, zero. You can imagine the programming you need in a computer system to accommodate the leap second. 
So yeah. what the various large technology companies, the Microsofts, the Googles, Amazons, Facebooks, Matters, all those, even government agencies, they're saying, you know what, let's just forget about it. The leap seconds are so inconsequential in keeping everything in sync that if we just forget about it, in 2,000 years, we'll have to do something. We'll have to do some adjustment, some bigger adjustment, maybe a leap minute. That's someone else's problem. That's, I think that's what they're kind of saying. That's tomorrow Matthew's problem, not today Matthew's problem. So let's just forget about it because, gee, it's a pain. All those times we've had to do it over the last 20 or since 1972, and they have caused some problems. When you actually look at the history of some of those, there are a couple of things that happened that were – Interesting if you knew what was happening, but if you look back in 2012, the leap second triggered a massive Reddit outage. Maybe not the most important thing in the world that it caused, but there was a massive Reddit outage when Reddit system didn't actually realize that the leap second had occurred. So suddenly there was a difference of one second, and so the system didn't like it. Mozilla, LinkedIn, Yelp, airline booking system called Amadeus also had a system, a problem with that as well. So there were some problems that happened. In 2017, a leap second call caused a glitch at Cloudflare where it knocked the whole company network infrastructure out because there was a bit of an internal argument with the computer systems going, hold on, we've just gone back a second in time. That can't happen, so I'm just going to shut down. Because it's obviously someone trying to do something that's a bit naughty out there, and so the easiest thing for me is to shut so it down. So, what's the deal here? We have to get all these different systems to agree to this, or is it a little bit simpler than that? Well, it, you have to actually get them to agree when the leap second occurs. It's not like the Y two K problem where there was just some bad program that had two digits for the year. When you do, and there's an international agreement about leap seconds, everyone then has to make sure that their system is ready and prepared for that extra 60 to drop in rather than 59 going to zero, zero. Yeah, okay. 59, go to 60, then go to zero, zero. Make sure all your systems are ready for it. In those cases, Cloudflare, Reddit, etc. Whoops, didn't get that one right. And then there's suddenly a one second out. And there's a lot of stuff that happens to make sure that things are working properly that check the exact time, mm. not just, oh, yeah, it's about right. It's the exact time. So when those are out, that's what caused the problem. So they said, some of these technology providers said, for all the work we've got to do to make it happen, when we do agree there's a leap second required, and let's face it, there might be the next leap second coming up fairly soon, they might just say, forget about it, and again, wait 2,000 years, things will be out by enough then that mm. we need to actually do something a bit more severe, and then we can deal with the problem once every 2,000 years rather than once every five years. And as you said, and it's not my problem because I won't be around in 2,000 <laughs> years' time. But it is fascinating, all the little things that happen behind the scenes to make simple things work. We've talked before about GPS, the accuracy of the clocks in GPS because they need to be so accurate that when the signals are sent at the speed of light at 3 by 10 to the 8 metres per second, there's enough distance that they're sent from the satellites that are sitting up there and our things that are sitting on the earth and all knowing the exact time mm. to work out how far away these various things are. We don't think about that. We just punch in, I want to go across to 10 Smith Street and you work out the rest from there, thanks very much. But all these things that people are working on behind the scenes and this is another one of those. Now, did you ever stop and wonder why Google serves up your search results in order that they do? Do you ever scroll down to the bottom of those searches or even go to the next page? How often do you go past the first three offerings? Google has a great deal of say in what sites are successful on the fabulous interweb, and they have the power to make and break businesses on the strength of that. So it's not safe to say that the top three sites are actually the best for your needs. In fact, you can test for yourself by shopping around, as analysts have done, and the difference in the top 10 searches just between Bing and Google are notable. Matt, I'm at risk of getting us in trouble in, with Google here. I think uh, I'm worried that if I do a search for our show now, it's going to give us um, a suggestion for TikToks with Michael Dockerson or something like that. Um, yeah, they're targeting us now. <laughs> well, I'll put a, a big red mark on our back there. We love you, Google. We love you. <laughs> it's fascinating what people research. This is some researchers in Germany. And they decided that they would compare search engines to see how similar the results are. Now, let's focus on Google and Bing. They did do DuckDuckGo and Metagar as well. But Metagar and DuckDuckGo actually use some of the indexing provided by Bing. So they got fairly similar results to Bing. So let's focus on Google and Bing. 
when they did 3,537 different queries, you can just imagine some students at these universities mm. saying, okay, your job is to go and put in a bunch of search tools or just items. Just think of stuff. That's right, and then go and search for that. So with all of these queries, they found that sometimes the overlap between Google and Bing was only around 25%. So you got so many different results out of those, as you said, those top 10, there might have only been two or three that were the same. So when they found the results in US results, they found 24 to 25% were similar. When they did them in Germany, don't know why it would be different, and I don't know why you would actually look for it differently in a different country, but mm. they did the, the same thing in Germany, they found that about 27 to 28% of those results were the same. So that was quite interesting for a start. There was different quite different low. countries. Quite low as well. And that's what I was fascinated about. I would have thought if I'm looking for blue widgets in Australia that I would get fairly common results across whatever search engine I use. Hmm. When they then drilled down in some of the results, one thing that was quite fascinating was that they found that Google never gave you YouTube as a search result because Google got a bit of pressure previously they used to have YouTube in their results. They own YouTube. So they were accused of favoring YouTube uh. because they own it. So they did the right thing and they said, we'll just exclude YouTube from our results, which seems like that's great. They're not favoring one of their own companies. But then if I search in Google for a thing, then maybe I do want the YouTube results in there. So I want the YouTube results, please, Google, but don't favor them. Just give them the same weighting as everyone else. But at the moment, you won't see them. And you take note next time you actually do a search, and I can hear people on their computers now going and searching for something <laughs> random, you won't see YouTube come up in those top 10 results. Well, I'm thinking about that. Anytime I want to search something that I want to watch on a video, I just go straight to YouTube anyway. You're probably right, and that's probably what most people do. But still, sometimes when you do search for something, you're not thinking about I wonder if there'll be something on YouTube on this or Wikipedia on this or just some general thing. You just want to search for it. Yeah. One thing they did find was that Wikipedia did feature very well in the results across different search engines. So that's good. I think Wikipedia is a reasonable source. The other one that was interesting that in the US, when you searched with Google, Fox News was interestingly absent from any of the results. Now, Fox News is a very right-leaning news source in the US. So Google obviously th thought, we don't want all that really extreme right information, so we'll just exclude those results. So they're still So are we just pushing far-right conservatives into the dark web? Is that what we're doing? I think we're just saying <laughs> we don't want to see their stuff. But that's yeah. what I'm saying. That's what Google's saying, and Google's got a bit more power than I have to influence these results. So mm. the amount of power that companies like Google, like YouTube have, like Meta and Facebook have – it's quite incredible. Yeah. So if I'm focused on Fox News, if I own Fox News and I really want it to be going quite well, not featuring any Google results is significant for me. So I want to talk to Google and say, why don't you have my results featuring? Surely Fox News is a trusted, inverted commas there, news source in the US. So surely you want my results coming up in the search results. But it is quite scary, isn't it, just how much it can be influenced by some of these major technology companies across the world. Yeah, and um, yeah, the, well, we talk about how information is power, or how that information is disseminated mm. is power. So I know now I'm going to actually start playing some little experiments and actually doing searches for things in Bing and Google and seeing what I get in terms of different results, seeing how many times, for example, YouTube might pop up in Bing or just different sites that I might be offered via Bing. Now, this isn't about the advertising as well. Obviously, when you search for things, you'll often see the ones that are supported by ads. And you'll see that they're, they're clearly displayed there. And that was something that's come up before, I think, as well, where Google got in a bit of trouble because they were preferring sites that paid the money, but they weren't mm. always clear in that. That's much clearer now. So you ignore some of those. I tend to ignore the ones that have got ads and look for the ones below that. But I'm going to actually start playing with Bing now and see how that goes in terms of comparing that to Google search results. According to this, I should get fairly dramatically different results. Locks. Yeah, we were talking about them earlier, that they're taking the battery out of them, but you can also now get them solar powered and with video capabilities. Matt, can we teach them to tap dance as well, perhaps? <laughs> Why not? What the heck? Now, I'm a fan. do everything. That's, well, that's almost where we're at. I'm a fan of having different technology components to do different things. When you try and combine lots into one, hmm. sometimes you just get a compromise, and I like to have the purest side of it rather than compromise. But in video doorbells and smart locks at the front door, 
what you often find is you've got two apps. So someone rings your video doorbell, you've got one app that you might use to look at that. Who's at my front door? Should I let them in? Tell them where to drop that pass or whatever. And then I've got my smart lock to get in. So I've got to open up a different app to get in or let someone else in with that smart lock. So that's a bit of a pain. I'd rather have them all built into one. So finally, we've got the Lockley Vision Elite and it's got everything built into one. So it's a smart lock. You can get into it with fingerprint. You can get into it with a passcode. You can also get into it via your app. And I tend to use apps more than anything else to get in with my smart locks. It just seems convenient to have the app on your phone. And some of them now you can actually wave it in front of it, use your watch, all sorts of things. But use the app, makes sense. But then, where do I put my video doorbell? Because I don't want that somewhere mm. else in another app. So that's now got the ability in this same lock, press a button on the doorbell, on the smart lock, sorry, and that's the video doorbell. So in the same app, I can see who's at my front door. That can be recorded in the cloud, all the things that video doorbells do, all wonderful. But the other pain is I've got some of my smart locks that I've got to change the batteries in Way too regular. It's probably only once every six months, but it seems like... But that seems like too irregular. It does, because yeah. the time you want to change them is the time... Oh, I don't have time to change it now. I don't have time to duck up and get some more batteries for yeah. it. It's a bit of an inconvenience. So they've also thought that maybe a good idea to protect some of the other parts on this lock and just to give a bit of a screen across the front of it, let's put a little screen on there that's also a little solar cell. So what I don't know yet... I haven't been able to find out, and there aren't enough reviews that have been done of this particular product yet, is is that enough to keep it going forever? It's got some rechargeable batteries built into it, obviously. Will that keep it going forever, or does it just extend the battery life, yeah, and every now and again I've got to plug into something and charge it up a bit further? Because it seems to me that good old surface area, damn you surface area, <laughs> it seems to me like the surface area on the smart lock is not enough to put enough charge into that lock to keep it going. Now, that's only me looking at it going, that doesn't seem like enough. I wonder what it does require, how much power it requires to actually do what it should do. Uh, I'll, I'll find it. I'll go and search for that, but I haven't been able to find an answer. It is a brand new lock, so people haven't probably had the time in their reviews to say, I put it in and I left it, and three months later I came back and it was flat. I expected it to go flat in a month, but it lasts for three months or whatever, or it just goes forever and ever and ever. Don't so stay tuned, folks. We'll give you an update in about four or five months. That's right. I'll go and get one and put it in there and, and play around with it and see how it goes. But I like the concept because, again, with all of this technology, we don't want to be filling up landfill, putting new batteries in all the time. So rechargeable batteries, that makes sense. But having some solar cells, which are getting better all the time, and when we go back to the very first thing we talked about, having very thin solar cells, Low efficiency, of course, but those thin solar cells, you'll see more of those on various products. Why not put a very thin solar cell across a product and start to feed a bit of power back in? Hmm. Excellent ideas. And with that, folks, we'll wind in our lines and stow the hooks away safely for another week in the world of all things technological. Thanks for another crowd pleaser, Matt. That was a bit of a struggle to get that word out after yeah. talking for, for 45 minutes. <laughs> bit of a tongue twister. Well, I think I'm going to commit and I'm going to put some real effort into binging over the next few weeks and even maybe try bringing back yahooing. Did you even know that you can't Alta Vista anymore? Oh, this is sad, isn't it? I've got a great story about Alta Vista. I was doing training one time, going off topic here slightly, but going, I was doing some training when I used to do lots of computer training for people, and I was talking to them about searching for things on the web, and Alta Vista, of course, was the site that I yep. used to use to show people. I remember that was the first site that was shown to me as a search engine, to, and, and that's what we were trying to be led into. There you go. Alta vista So in my training not realising there was a porn site that was very close in the spelling to Alta Vista. <laughs> I actually said to the students in the room, and they were, they were adult students, and I said, so what I would normally do, oh, look, I'll show you. I'll go to my favourite site. And I've typed in Alta Vista, and I made a small typo. <laughs> and up comes a very obviously pornographic site. So after I've told everyone in the room this is my favourite site, there's one there. I had to quickly tell them that wasn't my favourite site. I've spelled it wrong. Here, let me go and fix it up. There's a search engine there. I'm not sure if anyone in the class believed me. Maybe they just Sounds thought, like a likely story. That's right. It does, doesn't it? So, <laughs> so and it's interesting that you say binging. We do say we're going to Google that. It's Google become something. a verb now. Yeah. Do we go and bing that now? I don't think so, but maybe. Well, I'm going to start. That's right. We're starting right here <laughs> now, folks. Please, Google, don't alter our uh, searches as well. <laughs> we love you still. Uh, and that's all from me today, folks. Thanks again for tuning in. I'm James Eddy, and we hope to catch you again in another week's time. <laughs> <laughs>